Welcome everyone to our spotlight talk today. I am Larissa Huff and I am the communications and social media manager at the Wharton Eshrick Museum. Uh, I am joined today by Ethan Snyder, who will be talking to us about Eshrick's library. Um, a little bit of housekeeping during the talk itself, we're all going to stay on mute and let Ethan share all of his knowledge with us. Um, and if you have any questions or thoughts during the talk, you can drop them in the chat and we can bring them up um, towards the end. And at the end, when Ethan wraps up, we can unmute and ask questions um, out loud and have a little conversation if there's any questions to be had. Um, so that is all I've got. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Ethan. All right. Thank you, Larissa. I'll take it away and get my screen shared here. All right. Everyone can see all right. Perfect. Great. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining another Spotlight Talk this month. We appreciate that everyone continues to engage with us virtually while our site is close to the public and stay patient as we prepare to kick off another tour season next month. So my name is Ethan Snyder. I'm the manager of collections and public programs here at the Wharton Eshrick Museum, and I'm thrilled to present today's Spotlight Talk that's focused on Wharton Eshrick's library. So this Spotlight Talk is in honor of our new program, Off the Shelf, the Wharton Eshrick Museum Book Club that will begin in April. So check out our website for more information on this new in-person program. You can sign up there, um, buy your books at a local bookstore, um, and support local businesses. So a few announcements before we get underway formally. So first, our tour calendar is officially open. So check out our website for availability if you've been itching to get into the studio for the first time or itching to get back in there. Next, our spring exhibition, Movement is Life, opens in our visitor center on March 2nd. The exhibition explores modern dance as a catalyst for Warden Escherich's transition from painting to woodwork in the early 1920s. It features a number of really wonderful objects, and my personal favorite is a late 18th or early 19th century chest that Escherich carved up in the early 1920s. So if you're curious to learn more, um, next month's spotlight will be focusing on one of the prints in this exhibition, so stay tuned for more information on our website, social media platforms, and e-news. So if you've taken a tour of the studio before, you know that Escherich's bedroom is filled to the brim with books. And if you haven't had the opportunity to be in Wharton's home and studio before, here are a number of images of the uh, bookshelves in his bedroom. Um, and we can start to get an idea of the size of the collection, although I don't think that these photos quite do it justice. But judging by Escherich's library, materials related to his book collection, and his well-documented friendships with some of the most notable authors of his day, I think it's fair to say that Escherich was an avid book collector, if not an avid reader as well. There are about 15 bookshelves in total in Wharton's bedroom, filled with over 600 books and magazines in the one room alone. So I'll begin this talk with a bird's eye view of Escherich's library and provide some data visualizations to discuss the various types of books and authors represented. It is well storied that Escherich read his fair share of Walt Whitman and Henry David Thoreau and enjoyed friendships with the likes of Theodore Dreiser and Sherwood Anderson. So I'll try to cover some overlooked yet quite interesting texts in this collection um, in the talk before we dive into the list that Escherich used to track the books that he was lending out to his friends and clients. So there are roughly 688 books that have been cataloged as part of Escherich's collection in total. While Escherich had his well-sorted favorites, of course, there is much, much more to unpack in his large collection of books that span genres including literary fiction and criticism to art books, periodicals, poetry, as well as nonfiction covering topics such as timber, psychoanalysis, and sailing, just to name a few. Covering all of Eshrick's books in this short time would be absolutely impossible, and we'd probably need about 10 spotlight talks in total. So instead, we'll have to take this bird's eye view um, of the book collection to get a sense of Eshrick's reading and book collecting practices. So what we're looking at here is a pie chart that I've devised that shows us the distribution of various genres represented amongst Escherich's numerous bookshelves. In order to make classifying 688 books a manageable task, 
I've broken up the books and classified them with the following categories. We have literature, which includes novels, short stories, and plays. We have poetry. We have books on art and art history, books on architecture, magazines and periodicals, and finally, the broadest category, nonfiction. Out of the 688 books in the collection, um, literature, which includes fiction, short stories, and plays, makes up roughly about 15% of Escherich's books. Escherich's literature collection includes early modern texts like the Canterbury Tales and Shakespeare um, and some interesting uh, uh, yeah, 19th century texts like Maupassant, but the bulk of the literature collection is made up of novels by Escherich's contemporaries. There are a number of books written by friends like Theodore Dreiser, Sherwood Anderson, Ford Maddox Ford, and Jean Toomer. However, and I think that this is quite interesting, is that there are more books about these writers in Escherich's library than there are by them. I think that Escherich was either interested in what others had to say about these authors, who were also his friends, or he proudly collected writing about them as they gained recognition and success through time. That aside, these texts highlight Escherich's broader interest in literary modernism. Among these modernist texts, we find names like Thomas Mann, Ernest Hemingway, Catherine Mansfield, Zora Neale Hurston, and Richard Wright. One of my favorite highlights from Escherich's literature collection is this copy of William Morris's novel, News from Nowhere, um, originally published in 1890. And it's about a future socialist utopia that um, Morris kind of thinks up through this book. And there are a couple of reasons why I think that this one is particularly interesting. For one, Escherich obviously had an interest in the arts and crafts movement that he kind of began working at the tail end of. However, what I think is more prescient about the book is that Escherich appears to have acquired it in 1920, as you can see here, in Fairhope, Alabama. Considering that Fairhope was a Georgist community, I think that it's quite interesting that Escherich was reading and thinking about different ways of living and organizing communities while actually living in a place experimenting with just that. This edition of Morris's book was printed in Chicago and published by Charles Kerr that's based in the same city. And I'm left wondering whether this book might have actually been a gift from the Chicagoan Mary Marcy, who you can see on the right side of the screen, who was living in Fairhope at the same time as the Escherich family. Like Morris, Marcy was an avowed socialist and invited Escherich to help her illustrate Rhymes of Early Jungle Folk that was also being published by Charles Kerr. And we have lots of um, kind of pieces of ephemera from Charles Kerr in the museum in our cabinet desk as well. Roughly 5% of Escherich's books are poetry. This includes English language poetry by people like Shakespeare, William Blake, Escherich's favorite Walt Whitman, of course, as well as people like James Weldon Johnson and D.H. Lawrence. However, Escherich also has a fair share of world poetry translated from other languages. For example, there are multiple volumes of Chinese poetry, as well as a translation of the Rubaiyat. And what we're seeing here is a wonderful copy of D.H. Lawrence's collected poems that Escherich's wife Letty gifted him for his 50th birthday. We can find a beautiful pressed orchid flower behind the back cover, and in the inside cover, an inscription from July 15th, 1937, that reads, all's been said, many happy returns. Over a quarter of the books represented in Escherich's library are books about art. And these run the gamut of Escherich's multi-dimensional creative practice, covering paintings, printmaking, illustration, sculpture, and interior design. But they also include books on fashion and photography. Included in Escherich's art books are volumes on his contemporaries like Alexander Calder, Pablo Picasso, and Henry Barnum Poor, just to name a few. They also include books on Impressionist painters, Flemish old masters, Victorian illustrators, and Mexican folk art. There are just a few books on furniture included in this collection, such as a book on shaker furniture by the prominent collecting couple, Edward um, and Faith Andrews. Also a volume on Chinese furniture, as well as furniture from the Bauhaus school. At least two of Escherich's art books were gifted to him by his friend and old teacher from his papa days, Julius Block. And these include a volume on Chinese art as well as German woodblock prints. 
So two highlights from Escherich's collection of art books are actually German language books that I'm led to believe Escherich might have uh, purchased while he was traveling in Germany in 1931. And I'm going to try my best not to say the titles of these books in German because I don't think I'm going to pronounce them well, um, but you'll see the title and I'll give you the translation. So one is a book that we saw on the last slide here that loosely translates to danced harmonies. And it's a book of photography solely focused on dancers from the Herion School of Dance in Stuttgart, Germany. And in many ways, I think the collection of photographs uh, of photographs look a lot like Escherich's sketches of dancers at the Doing Gardner dance camp in the Adirondacks. And I imagine that these photographs inspired him as much as the dancers in the Adirondacks themselves. The other German language highlight, I'm not going to try to pronounce this, um, but it roughly translates to miniature paintings in the Islamic Orient. And what I find particularly fascinating about this volume is that Escherich left marginalia inside the book next to particular paintings. He translated the titles of these Middle Eastern paintings from German into English. And I don't know personally Wharton to have been a German language speaker. However, it's likely that he used his pocket-sized English-German dictionary also um, in the collection to help him translate these paintings. Um, so one of them we have here. Um, is Battle of the Animals, and I think the other one um, is um, translated as The Wedding Party. While the books on architecture make up only about 3% of the collection in total, I think arguably that they're the most telling of Escherich's influences for his architectural practice. Um, some books cover big names of modern architecture, like Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier, Others, though, like American Barns and Covered Bridges, highlight Escherich's interest in vernacular architecture. Another group comprising a book on Antonio Gaudi, a book entitled Ways to a New Style in Architecture by Rudolf Steiner, and one titled Art in Architecture um, that actually features Escherich's studio, shows us um, Escherich's interest in the relationship between art and architecture. And Escherich's copy of Art in Architecture, which um, is not pictured on the screen, um, has an inscription from the author that cheers, here's to Diamond Rock Hill, signed 1953. So the periodicals in Escherich's collection, I think, fall primarily into two categories. One is magazines about art, such as the wonderfully titled Magazine of Art, and the other are journals on arts and culture. These journals are mainly made up of volumes of The Dial, which is a journal published intermittently between 1840 and 1930. It first began as an output of the transcendentalist movement in the, and in the 20th century was revived with writing about politics, arts, culture, and criticism. Escherich's woodblocks even appeared in The Dial during the 1920s as well. The collection of periodicals otherwise uh, periodicals otherwise, is made up of things like museum bulletins, the Century magazine, where Escherich's work also appeared, and a number of um, playboys from the late 19-teens as well. Finally, the most expansive and unwieldy category is nonfiction. And this category feels so unwieldy because it captures a real wide range of books and topics, from boats and sailing, to secondary literature about Escherich's author friends, to writings by 19th century thinkers like Sigmund Freud, Marx and Engels, to books on European history. Among Escherich's nonfiction collection, I think, is where we find some of the most interesting highlights. For example, the oldest book in the uh, collection entitled Martyrology, you can see on the shelf here. Um, and it's a book of preachings published in 1677. Um, so no wonder it's bound in cloth to kind of keep it all together. Additionally, we find books written by Zora Neale Hurston, who actually signed them when Escherich saw her speak at the Cosmopolitan Club in Philadelphia's Rittenhouse Square neighborhood in 1940. As I mentioned earlier, many of Escherich's nonfiction books are works of criticism and biographies of his author friends, mainly Sherwood Anderson and Theodore Dreiser. It is curious that Escherich collected so many books on his friends, and I do imagine that he proudly acquired them as he followed his friends' writing careers. In the nonfiction category, we also find 
the book with perhaps the longest or oldest documented history of ownership, which is titled The Life of Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, written by John, uh, Reverend John Fleawood. The book was published and printed in New Haven in 1932, and you can see the stamp um, reading A. Gerhardt on the inside, which I presume was the first owner of this book. And on the inside cover, you can see that they used these um, pieces of paper that they pasted inside to record the births and death dates in the Gerhardt family, beginning with Abraham Gerhardt's birth in 1784 and ending with his wife Elizabeth's death in 1877. And on the inside cover, rather than the back cover, um, the births and death days of family members that I presume to be their children are also included here. So before we turn to Escherich's book loan list, which I think is really fascinating, I do wanna highlight some of the work done by our board member and Westchester University Special Collections Librarian, Ron McCall, um, on our book collection. Ron will be joining us for our book club as a volunteer moderator and well knows Escherich's literary world. So Ron put together these, I'll, I'll call them word bubble graphics, that show the authors that appear most frequently in Escherich's library. The graphic captures a few things, namely Escherich's circle of friends with Sherwood Anderson, Theodore Dreiser, Ford Maddox Ford, and the Harlem Renaissance writer Gene Toomer. But it also shows us that Escherich had an interest in the writing of one of his biggest, most important clients, Curtis Bach, whose music room and library Escherich created during the 1930s. Rachel Carson's appearance suggests that Escherich developed an interest in the environmental movement beginning in the 1950s. Additionally, the appearance of Rudolf Steiner's name suggests something about Wharton's interest in anthroposophy, involvement with anthroposophy's practitioners, as well as Steiner's writing on architecture and ways of living. We also see the name Sean O'Casey, which comes up in the book inventory quite a lot, and whose multi-volume autobiography is represented in Escherich's library. O'Casey was an Irish socialist, writer, and playwright who focused on representing the country's working class. We also see that Escherich has his fair share of Bertrand Russell, who is one of the most influential writers, philosophers, and logicians in the 20th century. And this one I think is quite interesting. So Bertrand Russell happened to spend a number of years, believe it or not, living in Malvern, Pennsylvania, in close proximity to Escherich during the 1940s and 1950s. For a period of time, he also worked for Albert Barnes as a lecturer on art appreciation. We don't know for sure that Escherich and Russell ever crossed paths. However, I do think it's possible consider considering that Russell's publications are so well represented in Escherich's library and that the two did trod some of the same paths. Might Escherich have at least known this philosopher lived nearby? Or is it Russell's or, um, is Russell's large footprint in the collection maybe more about Escherich's interest in his philosophical ideas? That I don't think we'll ever know, but they raise some interesting questions. So now I want to take a look at Escherich's book loan list. This is the list. Um, this is a list that's kept in the museum's archives, and Escherich began recording the books he was lending out in 1943, and the list extends all the way to 1969, a year before his death. A document like this allows us to ask questions not so much about the books themselves, but about how these books mediated the artist's relationships with both um, his friends and clients. We might ask what loaning a particular title tells us about Escherich's relationships or the frequency he loaned books to a particular individual. And the person who appears most frequently on this list is someone um, by the name Mac, which you can see I highlighted here in red. And this is just the first of many pages of his book loan list. So Mac is likely Escherich's friend and neighbor, Lachlan McLachlan, who lived over on White Deer Trail, caddy cornered to the octagonal schoolhouse that Escherich had used as a painting studio. If you've seen Alex Hainsworth's spotlight on gifts in the studio, you might already be familiar with Mr. McLachlan, who gifted Wharton two porcelain statuettes of Guan Yin. Lachlan McLachlan was a furniture maker who was born in Scotland and trained as a designer in London. 
Before getting into design and immigrating to the United States, McLachlan also apprenticed as an architect and went on to work for an interior design firm in London. This copy of the Grand Rapids furniture record that you see here on the right with a um, photo of Mr. McLachlan tells us that he immigrated to America in 1907 to be associated with the famous glassmakers at Tiffany Studios. He went on to work for W and J Sloan in New York City before he moved out to Grand Rapids, which at the time was the center of the American furniture industry, to work as the head furniture designer at a place called Berkey and Gay Furniture Company. And at the time, this company was mainly producing colonial revival furniture and masks, like you can see here. From some cursory census research, it appears that McLachlan and his wife Gertrude were living in proximity to the Eschericks by 1930. McLachlan and Escherich must have developed quite a friendship around their furniture making practice and interest in architecture. While, uh, while the furniture McLachlan was designing for factory production out in Michigan was fundamentally different from Escherich and his studio practice, Escherich's furniture must have rubbed off on McLachlan because in 1943, McLachlan made this three-legged walnut footstool sold at Freeman's auction about 16 years ago. And you can look at the stool and immediately see Escherich's influence in its soft corners, splayed legs, and sculpted seat. So in addition to influencing McLachlan's creative practice, which I imagine might have been the gentleman's retirement project, Escherich undoubtedly influenced McLachlan's reading practices as well. He appears on Escherich's book loan list beginning in 1944 and borrows no less than 46 book, uh, books by the late 1950s. The first loan in July 1944 um, were two books by Theodore Dreiser, as well as a book of poetry by someone named Robeson Jeffers. And McLachlan turned these three books back over to Escherich's hands by the next month, August. I imagine that McLachlan devoured the books, and considering that he borrowed two more that month, um, immediately came back for more. This time, McLachlan borrowed one, or I guess the one mass market book that Escherich illustrated, the novel Stuffed Peacocks by Emily Clark, as well as a book by Thoreau. These two books were also turned around by the next month, and by that point, McLachlan seems to be pretty hooked on Escherich's uh, collection of books. So a book in Escherich's personal collection suggests that the book lending with McLachlan went both ways. Opening up Escherich's copy of Ernest Hemingway's novel, A Farewell to Arms, reveals an inscription from McLachlan reading to Wharton Escherich from L. Mac L. 1952. Another name appearing on the list, however, only once in the span of Escherich's documentation is Horace Hartshaw. Hartshaw was a contract carpenter who lived right up the hill on Jug Hollow Road and helped build the 1956 workshop before he returned to Escherich's property as a shop hand to work through the 1960s. Hartshaw recollects in his oral history that his first ever job with Wharton Escherich was at the Dannenberg home. He often went out on jobs since his colleague and fellow shop hand, Bill McIntyre, preferred not to leave um, the workshop. One of Hartshaw's main jobs, as he remembers, was finishing pieces before they left the shop because apparently both Escherich and McIntyre had periods of poor eyesight, so it felt, uh, fell to Hartshaw to do the kind of final look over and finishing work on pieces of furniture. And in June 1962, Escherich lent Hartshaw the book Con Tiki, which you can see here, that's subtitled Across the Pacific by Raft um, by the Norwegian writer and expeditioner Thor Heyerdahl. One wonders what inspired Escherich to lend Hartshaw this book, but we do know that Escherich loved to tell Hartshaw stories while they worked together in the workshop. Hartshaw recalls hearing many different stories about Escherich's, quote, early days coming up Diamond Rock Hill with his Model T Ford and the real deep ruts from the spring rails and how he'd used to get stuck. We'll likely never know what spurred Escherich to lend this adventure narrative to Hartshaw, However, I'd like to think that it happened over a story or conversation in Escherich's workshop while the two were working on a piece of furniture together. Maybe a story about Escherich's travels or experiences sailing? Or could it have been a conversation between Hartshaw and Escherich about their hopes and dreams of future travel um, and adventures that might have sparked Escherich to say something like, 
Horace, do I have the book for you? Other names appear frequently on Eshrick's book loan list um, from clients such as Ellen Rove, Bess Hurwitz, the neighboring Almy family, as well as the Milliken family. And the book loan list also shows that Eshrick was lending quite frequently to old friends like Chick Peck and some of his love interests like Miriam Phillips and Hannah Vile. So beyond the well-storied books Escherich enjoyed, like Leaves of Grass and Walden and books by his author friends, there are a number of fascinating texts that gives us a glimpse into Escherich's relationships, his early publicity, influences, and possibly even some of his travels. So we're excited to continue digging into Escherich's extensive library with our book club participants and see what further questions and ideas we might uncover together. So now let's open up things for questions and comments. I see we have one in the chat here. Oh, oh I've got a, a question for you, Ethan. Yeah, please. shoot, Bob. Yeah. Um, when Bob Bascom first took me through the studio, he pointed out the library and in particular pointed out a book that had the cover taken off was Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. And I don't know the full story, but he seemed to feel that somebody either sent that to him or he procured it and they had to take the cover off because it was banned and they had to sneak it through customs or something like that. Do you have any idea what the full story is? You know, I don't know the full story of that. And I will be honest, like it took a fair amount of work to kind of classify all the books, but I didn't crack every spine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have well, there's heard, no there's no spine on this one. <laughs> I guess there isn't. But I have heard similar things um about smuggling books uh, mm -hmm. around Harold Mason, who ran the Centaur Press where Eshrick did a lot mm -hmm. of publishing or mm -hmm. illustrated a lot of books that were published. So I wonder if it would have been um a gift from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we do know that um, Harold Mason wrote Escherich birthday cards and they corresponded. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if this was a gift from. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's an adult section in Escherich's library, right? Yeah, and I think it's buried under a lot of other magazines. <laughs> Are there any books on music? So there is at least one book I can remember off the top of my head about music. And it's a either I would call it a biography or a kind of piece of nonfiction about Beethoven. And I know Escherich and his family to have been Bach fans, um, but I did not know that Wharton was also an interested Beethoven listener as well. Has his record collection been cataloged? So we don't have a record collection and we've always wondered if there was one. Um, to our knowledge, we've never you know, seen or uncovered anything um, that suggests he had a record collection. From what I've heard um, through oral histories, um, the Escherich family enjoyed the radio a lot, um, but I think it's unlikely that they wouldn't have also had a lot of records lying around too. Um, so maybe they were dispersed with a family. Thank you. This was so great, Ethan. If there's no more questions, um, we can send you guys back into the world to enjoy your afternoon. Um, as Ethan one, mentioned- One quick question. Oh, sure, yes. Um, you mentioned a book about timber. Can you explain that? Yeah, so we have a couple books about timber in the collection. Um, one of them is about native Pennsylvania trees. Um, which, if I can remember correctly, was from the 1950s, and that might have been a gift from one of Escherich's clients. Um, and I think the other one was maybe more about American timber more broadly. Um, I don't get the sense that 
these were books that Escherich was learning from at the beginning of his career, but maybe were ones that he was interested in as he was working with more domestic hardwood um, a little bit later on in his career. Are, are there other sources um, of information about how he thought about wood or how he experienced wood? Yeah, I think that there are a fair amount. Um, I'm sure that this is covered in some of our blog posts um, and definitely in our oral histories about the way that Escherich kind of could see a sculpture in a piece of wood and especially with his relationship with his lumber supplier, Ed Ray. Um, and Ed Ray seemed to be an artistic collaborator because he knew kind of Wharton's abilities and his visions and he would go out and look for particular pieces mm. of wood that could do the things that Escherich wanted them to do. Mm. So I think that mainly our best source of information would be Ed Ray. Hmm. Yeah. Any other questions out there? All right. Well, I will remind you that we will have a spotlight next month um, that is related to the exhibition that is opening in March. And our tours resume March 2nd. So be sure to come back and visit us. We're excited to open our doors again um, and see everybody. And be sure to check up on our website, sign up for the book club. Um, and we have lots of exciting things happening this spring. So we look forward to seeing you at all of those events. Thank you for coming. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.